Support WrestleTalk! Give us a subscribe. Thank you for being an awesome pledge hammer on Patreon. The event's known as Chris Anderson to the side. The best in the world! Duh. Brock Lesnar cashes in money in the bank. Brock Lesnar is the new Universal Champion. Brock Lesnar is the top guy on a brand that, as of now, is being creatively run by Paul Heyman. In hindsight, we probably should have seen it coming. I am Luke Owen. Give us a subscribe and help us reach our next target of 750,000 subscribers. Because it would be nifty to hit 750. 100,000 subscribers will work on it. Be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment down below to answer our question of the day. With all the great wrestling over the weekend, what was your favorite show? Perhaps it was Extreme Rules, in which case vote in the poll above my head to let me know what you thought of the show. Where you can choose from best of both worlds, great per view, thumbs in the middle, map of you and the worst of both worlds. This is WWE Extreme Rules 2019, a night where there are no rules. Apart from that mixed tag match where there were still rules. The pre-show had the usual bland nonsense, a panel of uninterested people spatting scripted lines, a few backstage promos and video packages. But the Extreme Rules pre-show also contained Baron Corbin's hideous new shirt. My eyes! Oh god, it's awful add to basket. The pre-show also saw a very fun match between Shinsuke Nakamura and Finn Balor for the Intercontinental Championship, a title that has done Finn no favors whatsoever since he's been on SmackDown TV once since May 14th. It's now the middle of July. Shinsuke Nakamura finally returned to TV this week as well, where he beat Balor to set up this match. And he beat him again, but this time captured the IC title. Well, I guess we won't be seeing much of you on TV, mate. Drew Gulak retained his Cruiserweight Championship in front of his home crowd against Tony Nese. This was solid stuff, but it wasn't on the level of previous Cruiserweight matches, or even Gulak's match with Matt Riddle at Evolve's 10th anniversary show the day before. And really, the Cruiserweight Championship hasn't had much of a spark about it, certainly not since the days of Cedric Alexander. Alexander, Buddy Murphy, and Mustafa Ali. After a very cool intro package for the show, featuring close-up shots of this lady's mouth, can you feel it now? We got our opening contest between Drew McIntyre and Shane McMahon against the Graveyard Dogs. Which means it's time to find out the results of Friday's poll. What is the worst tag team name in WWE? And shockingly, but maybe not that shockingly, Besties Best for Business won with 60% of the vote, with Graveyard Dogs only earning 7%. And while I don't think anyone was particularly thrilled about another pay-per-view match between Roman Reigns, Drew McIntyre, and Shane McMahon, the smoke and mirrors nature of this no-holds-barred tag match was a lot of fun. Taker and Roman both got moments to shine, Elias came in for some interference, and Shane played his greatest hits with an elbow drop through a table and the coaster coast with a trash can. However, not even the Omni Shane can survive the mega powers of the Graveyard Dogs, with Undertaker tombstoning Shane for the win. It was way better than his match with Goldberg at Saudi Showdown. Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins cut a couple of horrifically scripted promos backstage that was so bad, Becky barely even tried to deliver her line about a statue being covered in bird poop. The Revival defended their Raw Tag Team Championships against the Usos next, even though for some reason I wrote that the Usos were the champs in my notes. It's almost like these titles don't actually mean anything at the moment. I actually had really high hopes for this match based off their previous encounters, and the fact that both teams are among the best in the whole wrestling world. But the crowd were really flat and didn't pop for any of the near falls or big spots. And a quiet crowd would be a recurring theme for this pay-per-view, with the Philly audience seemingly being virtually silent for most of the matches on the show. But to be fair, this match was a bit flat and saw Revival retain with the Shadow Machine. Disappointing this was. What wasn't disappointing, however, was Cesaro vs. Alistair Black, the latter of which got an amazing hype package beforehand. This was awesome from start to end. Cesaro hit a springboard European uppercut. That was awesome. Cesaro caught Alistair Black's double knees and hit a launching European uppercut. That was awesome. Cesaro tried another springboard, but Black caught him with a bicycle knee. That was even more awesome. And Black eventually won with a black mass from out of nowhere. A great showcase for both men, and they felt like huge stars coming out of it. Do more of this, WWE. Truth was looking for Drake Maverick backstage, but instead stumbled upon Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. Bliss gave Cross a present, her brand new coffee-inspired t-shirt. She... 
She really likes that coffee gimmick, doesn't she? Street Profits walked up to do some comedy, with Nikki telling them that she and Alexa would be co-champions. She was very much, however, incorrect, as Bailey retained her SmackDown Women's Championship in a two-on-one handicap match. And despite the teasers on SmackDown and on commentary, there was no Sasha Banks on the show whatsoever. The match was so-so, and is hopefully the end of what has been one of the worst told stories of 2019. Then came perhaps the best portion of the show, where beefy Bobby Lashley took on beefy Braun Strowman in a last beef standing match to determine the beef in the world. Oh, it's beefy. These two lads threw each other from pillar to post all over the arena to thunderous applause from the audience, easily the loudest they'd been since Taker and Roman beat Drew and Shane earlier in the night. The finish saw Braun power slam Bobby off the stage and threw a mystery box of some sort and then exploded out the wall like the Kool-Aid man to answer the 10 count. This was like a real life Godzilla fight and I loved every single moment of it. Mean Charlie Caruso then tried to segue from that match by saying, and I quote, wow, and that is exactly why it's called Extreme Rules. Wow, that was, that was poor, Charlie. You really need to have a word with Queen Kayla Braxton about your segues. Charlie then interviewed AJ Styles, who said that he was going to take away Ricochet's United States Championship and then wouldn't let Charlie join in the too sweet fun. That's <laughs> not much fun being on the end of the mean stick, is it, Charlie? The crowd quieted back down once again for the planeteers of Daniel Bryan and Rowan defending their SmackDown Tag Team Championships against Heavy Machinery and New Day, which saw Big E and Xavier Woods become six-time tag team champs. This was pretty good action to be fair to the six guys who did several big dives and some wonderful near falls, but the crowd just weren't into the action at all. New Day celebrated backstage with Kofi Kingston who was set to be interviewed by the brilliant Kayla Braxton, but Paul Heyman stormed past them and stole the microphone to cut virtually the same promo he did on Monday's Raw. Once again teasing that Brock would cash in later tonight. Yeah, <laughs> okay there Paul, Brock Lesnar's cashing in. <laughs> like I'm gonna fall for that one been teasing that for months, mate. <laughs> fool me once, but not fool me again, bucko. The solid action continued as AJ Styles with the club in tow took on Ricochet for the United States Championship. Laurie Blake brought up a really good point in our prediction video for this show, where he said that WWE were in a tricky spot here. Ricochet's just won the US title, his first on the main roster, so you don't want to take the belt off of him too early. But AJ has just turned heel with the club, and has already lost to Ricochet on Raw, so you don't really want him to lose again. And credit to WWE, they booked around this brilliantly, with Ricochet on several occasions overcoming the odds of having Gallows and Anderson on the outside, and nearly picked up the win with a huge shooting star press. But Carl Anderson was there to point out that AJ's foot was under the ropes, playing off the finish to Raw a couple of weeks ago. Gallows crotched Ricochet on the top rope, allowing AJ to hit a middle rope styles clash for the win. This was Excellent pro wrestling. We got a recap of Kevin Owens' antics on SmackDown and his tweet where he listed all of the WWE talent that aren't on the pay-per-view, including the Viking Raiders, AOP, Kabuki Warriors, and Billy Kidman? Owens then pinned Dolph Ziggler very quickly with a stunner in a match that was announced earlier in the day. It's another big win for babyface Owens, and yet another loss for Ziggy Stardust. Speaking of losing all the time, and Kofi Kingston retained his WWE Championship over Samoa Joe in a very standard match. There was some really nice stuff in here though, with a vicious Joe targeting the fingers of Kofi, even shutting them between the steel steps to play off Kofi's middle finger angle from SmackDown, and there was an even nice play on Joe losing all the time via roll-ups off the Kikina clutch, with Kofi trying to do the Piper Brett spot, but Joe instead just slammed him into the mat. But sadly the crowd never bought into Joe winning, and Kofi proved them right by winning with the trouble in paradise. This crowd was so unconvinced of Joe winning, a large portion of them started chanting for Lesnar to cash in. Kofi really needs a big WWE Championship feud to lead into SummerSlam, one where it feels like his title is actually in jeopardy, you know, as opposed to facing mid-card acts like Dolphin Joe. And the main event of the show was the match absolutely no one cared about, Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins taking on Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans in a mixed tag match with EXTREME RULES! Rules that are so extreme that men can only take on men and women can only face the women and there have to be legal tags. Um, EXTREME. 
This sadly falls into a lot of logic holes. Why do they need to obey these rules if they can't be DQ'd if they break them? And these holes are probably part of the reason that the crowd were not into this match at all. Well, apart from the fact that Becky and Seth are defending against Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans yet again. And there was even a point where the crowd didn't pop for the good guys doing joint dives through tables on the outside, again chanting for a Lesnar cash-in. Just totally not buying into Baron Corbin's near falls on Seth at all. In fact, the only thing the crowd popped for was Corbin giving Becky the end of days, which they came unglued for. This led to Seth unloading on Corbin with kendo stick and chair shots, finishing him off with three curb stomps. But before Seth could celebrate, the familiar sound of Brock Lesnar's music hit, and he stormed to the ring with a referee in tow. After a couple of German suplexes, Heyman officially cashed in Money in the Bank, and Lesnar became a three-time Universal Champion with a single F5. Heyman and Brock celebrated on the ramp. Here we go again. Apart from the sour taste left in my mouth from the main event and its following angle, Extreme Rules was a great show. The first few hours in particular were among the best the companies put out in 2019. Even the matches that were so so weren't terrible, and you had the highest of highs with Cesaro versus Alistair Black, Braun Strowman versus Bobby Lashley, and AJ Styles versus Ricochet. In fact, if you've not watched the show, just turn it off after that US title match and you'll have a really good time. Extreme Rules 2019 was a great purview. Wanna see me review Spider-Man Far From Home while playing Spider-Man for the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive? And do you wanna see me and Laurie play Cuphead poorly? Then click the Screen Stalker video on screen right now. I've been Luke Owen, and that were wrestling.